50th anniversary of Earth Day. And I'm really excited to be able to uh, reach a larger audience doing my first ever virtual event. So I will introduce myself. If you don't know me already, my name is Danielle Nolan. I go by Money, and I work for the Office of Sustainability at George Mason, running the Greenhouse and Gardens program. Um, so with me helping me to host this event, I have four of my staff that I would like to introduce as well. Um, in no particular order, I have Lynn Ruffa, who is one of my greenhouse and gardens team leader. She helps me to manage the hydroponic greenhouse on campus. Today, she will be helping to load the slideshow as well. Lynn, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I'm so excited to be working with the program. I love um, teaching new volunteers about fresh food. We had a volunteer um, before we got shut down and he had never had like a really good tomato and he just didn't think that he liked tomatoes. And then Donnie let him try one and he was so excited. He's like, oh, that's actually really good. So just those little experiences are really awesome. It's awesome. Yes, thank you for sharing. We also have Alexa Hines. She is the garden team leader and also the GOGA president. Um, GOGA short for the gardening club at Mason. Alexa, you want to say a few words? Hi, um, can you guys all see me? Yes. Can you guys see me? Yes. Oh, hey, so I'm really honored to be here with you guys today, at least virtually. Um, I'm also really excited to be here for our sustainable food webinar. I think it's really important to understand the impact our food has on our environment. I think a lot of people don't know that. And, you know, our food is a basic staple. That's like our key to survival. And I like how we're spreading the word and it's becoming more normalized, um, teaching people how we grow food. So, so yeah, I'm really excited for this and I hope you guys all enjoy it. Thank you so much. So next up we have Hala, who is one of my new staff members. She has years of experience with um, marketing for local farmers markets, and we're so glad to have her as one of our Greenhouse and Gardens team leaders. Hala, would you like to say hello? Um, hello. Um, I usually put a Band-Aid over my camera. Um, my laptop, so I realized I still had a Band-Aid on. Um, <laughs> yeah, my computer does not have an ouchie or anything. It's just like, you know, to cover the camera. Anyway, so uh, my name is Hala. I formerly worked at the Fairfax County Farmers Markets, which is under the Fairfax County Park Authority. And I've been running those markets for about three years. Um, I joined Donnie er, earlier this year around like, February. And um, there's a lot to learn from her. Um, she's a wealth of knowledge and I'm excited to um, learn more from her. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, my staff member, Riss, who uh, has worked with me for a few years and he is graduating this semester. Congratulations, Riss. Would you like to say hello? Sure, yeah, hi. Um, my name is Riss, like Donnie said, I'm a graduating senior. Um, I've worked with the office for about two years now. Um, super excited to hear Donnie's lecture. And um, if you want to learn more about how to get involved with the sustainable food projects on campus, uh, feel free to reach out to me because I've been involved with a lot of things in the past four years. Awesome. Thank you so much. So as a reminder, please put your video and audio on mute. So everybody um, is just seeing the slides, my video and my voice. We don't want any interruptions or or things like that. All right, thank you. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, everybody should be able to see the slideshow um, in the background here. And Lynn is hosting the slides for me, so you'll hear me say next slide um, and she will change the slides. And we're doing it that way because I'll let you know that I do live way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'm surrounded by forests and I'm hosting this in my small Airstream trailer. So my Wi-Fi connection is not that great. The bandwidth is pretty small. So um, during the test runs, the slides were lagging. So by having Lynn host the slideshow, um, it gives my Wi-Fi more room to host my video. If it does lag, please let me know in the chat box. I'll also be asking some questions where you can participate in providing and guessing your answers on the chat to everyone. 
And if there are any issues uh, moving forward, I will just um, remove my video so that you just hear my voice and see the slides. That way you won't have to see me if, if it's causing any, any lagging issues. All right, so thank you so much again for joining us. I'm so grateful for your time, and I really hope that you learn a lot during this webinar, and hopefully I will inspire you. So I have a slideshow prepared. We will talk about the environmental impacts of agriculture globally and overall. I will be explaining the science behind GMOs, because there are so many misconceptions around that. And um, lastly, I will talk about the solutions to make our food systems more sustainable. So um, the first slide. Um, oh, I was supposed to ask a question. Wait, wait. <laughs> I forgot what I was supposed to ask you. Um, how much do you think, I want you guys to guess, how much do you think agriculture contributes to global greenhouse gas em emissions percentage wise? How much do you think agriculture contributes to global greenhouse gas emissions overall? So does anybody guess? Oh, someone said over 13%, 35, 60, one third. Yes, you are all very close. Okay, so now Lynn, you can switch to the next slide. So this pie chart shows that it's about 24% estimated that agriculture contributes to global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a lot. That's almost the same as electricity and heat production. So while we typically think of um, solar panels and um, electrical cars toward moving towards sustainability, those efforts um, you know, should also be looking toward agriculture as a potential solution because it's a huge source, source of emissions um, that contribute to global warming and, and these, these issues that are considered a, a huge crisis. So um, the information I'll be giving you is, is very helpful to understand why agriculture causes these issues. Next slide, please. So the food system is huge, right? We have what, 7 billion people on our planet and they all need to eat several times a day. So every single one of us relies on this huge food system. It starts with food production on farms. It um, includes transportation uh, and sales. You have to manufacture some foods. A lot of food is processed and packaged and then transported again where it goes to retail stores and restaurants. Um, and then of course there's a ton of waste that happens in the system so that we can provide fresh food toward everybody. So there's so much that goes into the system and of course a lot that comes out of it as well. So you can imagine um, the amount of impact this has. In the next slide, um, I'm talking about the land use. So of course food production requires land, right? Most food is grown on a flat surface um, and a huge amount of our terrestrial earth is used for food production of some sort. So you can imagine that there are a lot of consequences because of all of this land use. And you can probably guess one huge factor of using land to make it usable for agriculture is deforestation. So on the next slide, you'll see um, deforestation is a huge issue that is a big reason why agriculture contributes so much to global warming um, is because of deforestation. And the top three reasons uh, why forests are being destroyed for agriculture are beef, soy, and palm oil. In fact, they estimate that there is a size of Switzerland of forest being destroyed every year just to um, create more land. Of course, with more people needing more food, we need more land. We only have one earth. How are we going to produce all of this food? Um, so I want to talk next about palm oil. So the next slide. Palm oil is a huge factor of deforestation, right? It's a tropical plant. It's the reason why, one huge reason why the rainforests need to be cleared to make way for palm oil plantations like this one pictured. In fact, palm oil is found in, in over half of products that you'll find in your supermarket. 
even shampoo and lipstick, like non-food items require palm oil that typically gives it that um, consistency. So um, the palm oil industry a few years ago was $65 billion. And by next year, it's expected to reach $92 billion. So you can imagine that there's a huge economic driver toward destroying these tropical rainforests to make way for more palm oil. So the next slide you'll see, and, and you can even imagine the amount of destruction that contributes to global warming um, caused by the, the need for more land to, to grow food. Um, and particularly, they will burn these forests because it's sometimes cheaper and quicker than trying to save the labor is that they just burn it. Um, and that's typically to make room for crops and, and livestock. So you can imagine all the carbon that's released from these trees escapes to the atmosphere and contributes to global warming. So I want you to guess again. Here's another question. Um, how do you think deforestation ranks among the leading causes of climate change? So out of all the causes of climate change, what number do you think deforestation is? Do you think it's the fifth leading cause? Do you think it's the first leading cause? Someone says it's the third leading cause of climate change. Any other guesses? A lot of threes out there. That's very close. All right, so it looks like somebody guessed it. Next slide will show you. It is estimated to be the second leading cause of climate change, and that's huge. Deforestation also destroys a lot of resources and ecosystems that would uh, otherwise be available to indigenous communities and, of course, wildlife that are destroyed, all the CO2 emissions that are released. And it also um, really affects water quality in these areas as well. Um, forests really protect water quality. And of course, when you remove those forests, um, all that, all the water that's coming onto that land is getting washed away and causes a huge issue, um, which will which will go into stormwater um, in a minute here. Um, but next, I want to talk about soil. So in the next slide, you'll see that farming, of course, requires soil and a lot of it. So this image in the background is an image of really healthy soil. But typically, after even just growing for one or two years on a patch of soil, the soil gets really depleted. Um, and typically, farmers are going to till their soil which means they have these machines with discs that turns it over and chops it up into smaller pieces. This is a really great way to kill weeds and it also loosens the soil so that roots can grow in there nice and easily, but it actually can release carbon even as carbon dioxide. Um, and it destroys a lot of the good fungi and worms and all those good guys that are in the soil. Tilling just destroys it and exposes them to the surface. And of course, when that soil is loose, it's going to run off when it rains. If there's a really hard rainstorm, it's going to pick up all that soil and that soil is going to run off with the with the storm water and cause a lot of erosion. Um, even without huge storms, soil just gets depleted. Plants are going to absorb the fertilizer and you constantly have to add more soil and, and more fertilizer with each crop. Um, and of course, all those fertilizers also get washed away with the storm water. Um, even soil can contribute to air pollution as well. Um, tilling, as I mentioned, as well as fertilizer, especially if applied improperly, it can just gas off and, and further contribute to, to global warming, just, um, just, just fertilizers and, and the chemicals. Um, so in air and water, tilling and all this land use just to grow the food contributes a lot to pollution. So in the next slide, you'll see an image of soil erosion. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen soil eroding before. It's really common. Um, you know, I see it on campus all the time. Pretty much whenever you don't have a mature forest, you're likely going to have some type of erosion or stormwater runoff. So this is a picture of a farmer who has a really hard time controlling the erosion on his field because it's on this huge incline. And when there's not enough mature plants holding the soil with their roots, of course, it's going to wash away. That rain has to move somewhere. All that stormwater is going to move uh, with the incline wherever there's least resistance. And it's going to take the soil with it and all the fertilizer with it. This can cause a lot of issues downhill. In the next slide, um, this is an image of one of the largest watersheds in the US. So you're probably familiar 
The watershed uh, in Virginia is the Chesapeake, mainly Chesapeake watershed is really big, but the Mississippi River is a huge watershed that covers about 41% of the United States. And all of that um, travels down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. And um, every year there has been a dead zone um, near Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is because of all of the pollution from the stormwater and the fact that it moves down the rivers and the streams and it releases into the ocean, carrying all of that pollution with it. In fact, even soil solutes can act as pollution because they're blocking the sunlight from getting to the aquatic plants. Um, and it can also kill the aquatic life. So as you can see, there's actually a dead zone, meaning that there are no living organisms, um, mainly aquatic life. There are no aquatic life able to thrive in this zone. And it's estimated um, to be 7,800 miles wide. So it's a huge impact. Um, and you might think that pollution and stormwater is a bigger issue in cities. But you can see via this image, those red dots are representing the cities and they're very small um, and there's not nearly as much of the city area compared to the farmland. So the green in this image here is representing the farmland that drains into this watershed. So uh, I heard somebody make sure that your video is on mute, please. Thank you. Um, so I was saying the green on the image represents the farmland, so you can see it far outnumbers the amount of city space um, in this watershed. So the, the, this dead zone is caused by all of this farmland contributing fertilizer and soil runoff and um, all kinds of pollution. So in the next time, I'm going to explain how exactly this works. So it's actually a phenomenon called eutrophication. So this is how pollution creates a dead zone in bodies of water. It's mainly from fertilizer. So plants need a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two nutrients that are um, present in fertilizer in the highest concentrations because plants need them to survive. If plants don't have them, they die. So you constantly have to add more nitrogen and phosphorus. But of course, when it rains, a lot of that nutrient gets washed away. Um, plants are not that efficient they can only absorb about 40 to 60% of the fertilizer that's present around them in any given moment. So about half of that fertilizer that you're applying is really getting washed away and ending up in our waterways. And basically that excess of fertilizer and nutrition in the water causes algae to grow because some creature is gonna to wanna to eat that extra food in the water. And so algae grows rapidly because it's eating this extra nutri nutrition. Um, and what happens when the algae dies and decomposes, it takes up all the dissolved oxygen that's in the water and the aquatic life rely on dissolved oxygen to breathe. So what happens, you have this algae bloom and then afterward, as the algae dies, all the aquatic life in the water there just suffocate because there's no more dissolved oxygen in the water and they literally just die. And so that's why the pollution is, is connected to the dead zones. In the next image, you'll see another example of eutrophication is um, the red tide, right? We've all heard of red tide before. If you've ever been to an oyster fest that had no oysters because red tide um, makes them toxic to eat, or it just kills them. It's a huge issue. Um, and red tide actually refers to the algae um, that has a red color that blooms. Um, and this this does happen in the Gulf of Mexico as well. And so this is this is one reason why we have that huge dead zone um, and why, why we might not be able to eat oysters all times of the year. It's because of the pollution causing these issues um, downhill and, and down the, the streams um, that are depleting our food sources. So it's a really big issue. In the next slide, I'm showing um, a graphic image about the nitrogen cycle. So you can see that, you know, of course there are nitrogenous wastes like nitrous oxide that come out of fossil fuels and factories. Um, and there's also natural nitrogen gases being produced from bacteria. But a lot of the nitrogenous wastes are coming from fertilizers, um, cattle, um, and, and some of it can gas off. So you can see in the image there is an arrow. Some of it just gases off as ammonia or NH3. Some of it can run off, as I explained, on land, commonly with the stormwater. 
And then some of it can also leach down into the um, ground, of course. That's a lot of the water it ideally leaches down into your roots, but it goes even further down into the groundwater, where then it can actually pollute um, well water sources. And even from there, it can leach back into the body of water and further cause eutrophication issues. So, of course, this is a natural cycle of nitrogen, right? Plants need nitrogen, cow manure and fertilizer have been used for, you know, thousands of years, um, just even and organically. But with the amount of food that we have to produce, and the amount of fertilizer those plants need, there's a huge amount of excess nitrogen that's causing these huge issues, right? We're losing some of our um, seafood sources because of these. So in the next slide, this is just an overview. It's really challenging to record um, and even try to figure out how can we solve these issues because these, these sources of pollution are considered non-point sources, I meaning you can't just point to it and say, oh, well, it's this farm or it's all farms, right? Because there's so many farms, there's so many areas, even lawns that are being fertilized. Um, and livestock all over the place that are moving and changing in numbers. Um, so it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to point to the source of this pollution. It's literally called non-point source pollution. So um, it's difficult to, to track, it's difficult to um, estimate the totals, and of course it's difficult to try and stop these processes because it's so, um, it's so everywhere, right? Um, I do want to mention as well that, that methane is a source of um, nitrogenous gases, or it's actually, I'm oh, sorry, CH4 is a non-nitrogenous gas um, that comes from cows and other food waste. Um, and if you don't know already, methane is a gas that contributes to global warming, except it's tr about 21 times stronger than CO2. So it's very, very strong. Um, and so I will be talking about cattle and how the beef industry contributes to global warming. But first, I want you to guess what fraction of Earth's land do you think is devoted to cattle? What fraction of Earth's land do you think is devoted to cattle? Is it half? Is it one eighth? One tenth? Fifty percent? Thirty percent? Right. I mean, if you look at all of the terrestrial land on this earth and how much of it is devoted just for cattle, 50 percent, one third. Yeah, these are really good guesses. So this next slide will show you the answer. It's estimated to be about um, a third of all terrestrial land on earth is used for cattle. That's a huge amount. Can you imagine a third of our land? It's not for housing people. Um, it's literally a third of our land is just for cattle. Um, and about 70% of the planet's agricultural land is really devoted toward livestock. Um, and also a large portion of deforestation is specifically for cattle. About 80% is estimated um, deforestation just for cattle and the beef industry. So the beef industry is really, really detrimental to the environment. And the reason that is, is because it's not efficient. Cows are not efficient, right? It takes a lot of food. I mean, like every day, these thousands of cows, like in this image here on this feedlot, are eating truckloads. I mean, there are like trucks after truck after truck, just bringing constantly food to feed these cows. And that happens, you know, after years and years of that cow, of that single cow growing to produce it's very inefficient. It takes so much food to produce a very small amount of meat. So they are very inefficient. If you go to the next slide, you'll see how large these feedlots are. Um, and they're trying to make it more efficient, right? If we can fit a lot more cattle in a smaller space. You can see though in this image that um, these feedlot areas are being drained into this pond nearby. So that's all of their feces and excrement all containing those nitrogenous wastes. Um, getting washed away with the stormwater and ending up in that little um, lake, which of course is going to further leach into the land, um, into the groundwater, you know, continue into the waterways. Um, and of course, there are not a lot of regulations to try and clean this water, right? They're just trying to keep it maintained so it's not going into the streets or neighborhoods. Now, can anybody guess what these large circles in the background are in this photo? What do you think all those circles are in the background of this cattle feedlot? 
lagoons. <laughs> well, you can see the blue is definitely the lagoon on, on the side there where all the wastewater is going. But those circles in the background are actually um, fields. They are fields for corn and soy. Exactly. Somebody guessed grain. So the reason why there's so much land devoted toward cattle is because we have to grow all that food. So all that corn and all that soy is going to feed cows, right? We don't have enough grass. Naturally, cows eat grass and they eat a lot of grass. They have a huge amount of land to graze um, and eat grass, but we don't have enough grassland to feed all the cows that we want to feed our populations with beef. So there's a ton of corn and soy um, that is grown on a ton of land, right? Um, what do we say? Like 80% or 70, one third of all land on earth is covered in not only the cattle feedlots or, or grazing grasslands, but also is for the corn and the soy just to feed all these cattle in these feedlots since they're not eating grass. So the next slide, I have um, a graph here that um, is showing the difference between different meats. Um, so of course, on the far right, um, vegetables like beans and peas um, eaten directly by humans have a very small carbon footprint. In comparison, you can see um, pork and seafood are a little bit more, but of course the um, ruminant animals like sheep and beef, um, basically they, they chew their grass um, many times. Actually, they chew their food, they have eight stomachs and their food comes back to their mouth and back to the stomachs. And so that process of um, rumination that they do to digest their food um, creates a lot of methane, right? Um, and they're expelling that methane gas um, that goes directly to the atmosphere. And it's really hard, if not impossible, to try and capture that methane gas. But as we also mentioned, because these um, meat products are so inefficient. There's also so much pollution coming out of the production of feed just for these cattle. Um, what's interesting is this graph estimates that even grazing beef, meaning we're not having to grow the corn and the soy to feed them, still have a larger carbon footprint than the feedlot beef. And that's because they take so much land to naturally graze cattle. Um, so even a more natural method of raising cattle is still very inefficient and still very detrimental. Ooh, we have a question here. Do you think local meat is more sustainable than fruits and veggies grown far away and transported to their destination? That is a really good question. Um, I haven't seen any direct comparisons of the transportation versus um, like locally having to heat a greenhouse to be able to grow tropical tropical foods or even that comparison of transportation to meat. Um, and certainly we think of transportation as being a really large part of, of climate change and global gas emission, green, greenhouse gas emissions. However, if you remember that pie chart, my first slide, transportation is actually a very small or at least much smaller chunk of that pie chart compared to agriculture. So I think that it might be more sustainable to transport tropical food from an area where it's grown easily because the season allows for that compared to um, growing something that um, takes a lot of land that creates a lot more gas emissions, right? Methane is several times more powerful than the CO2s that might be released from that transportation. Even local meat, unfortunately, um, can still have a really big um, impact on the environment and that potentially um, fruits and vegetables, since their footprint is so much smaller, that the transportation it takes to get to you is probably significantly lower than even growing meat locally without the transportation. So that's a really, really good question. And of course, it's very difficult to um, analyze this data because it's all um, Right, there's there's no way to point to one source, so it is it is it is challenging to come up with these estimates. And you'll find sources for different numbers. Right, this one has 14.5 percent um, attributed to livestock. So a lot of the numbers can can change, and of course they're all estimates. But it gives you a really good idea that um, it's saying that even out of the numbers we discussed earlier, that 14.5 percent of uh, greenhouse gas pollution is just from livestock alone. So these these are huge factors that typically are not talked about, right? We're we're looking a lot at like like electricity and transportation because we see it and experience it more. Most people today experience the production or how it's made. So it, it's really important to look at these aspects. In the next slide, um, I'm showing a um, just a field of corn. 
um, where I live, it's super common, um, even right outside of Northern Virginia. Well, I'm still in Northern Virginia, um, just past Manassas, for example, um, even just like a 20 or 30 minute drive from George Mason's campus, you'll see a ton of corn and soy fields. They do corn one year and they do soy the next. And of course, all those fields require fertilizer, emissions from the tractor. They're always tilling. There's actually a lot of dust that can come out of the um, chemicals on the field from tilling it, um, from the pollen um, and, and everything. And of course, this really does impact those living nearby as well as the aquatic life in the streams. Um, there's even a lot of cattle um, near my house out here that um, they wade in the rivers. And of course their um, excrement ends up um, directly going into the waterways and causing pollution. So um, the, the, these systems are not as far as you think um, and, and they cover a huge amount of land, not very far from our campus even. So in the next slide, I'm starting the part of the presentation where I talk about pesticides. So these, um, there's a lot of um, common misconceptions so the word pesticide um, refers to any chemical that kills something, right? It's gonna kill some kind of pest. Um, and the word pest can be very broad. Sometimes we have squirrel and deer eating our pets, or sometimes it's a virus or a bacteria that's also a pest on your crop. But most farmers, in fact, the average farmer is making a negative income. Most farmers are in debt. So if they have a pest on their crop, they're gonna do whatever they can and whatever is cheapest so that they still make some profit margin on their crops. So you have a farmer, every farmer uses pesticides. Even, even, their, even organic food is grown with pesticides. There are plenty of organic pesticides. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about insecticides. So there's um, these three words on the list, pyrethroids, carbamate, orthophosphate, those are chemical insecticides. And then we also have organic insecticides. There's actually um, a nicotinoid, um, nicotine-based insecticides. Um, yes, nicotine is very toxic. Um, you'll see um, the bugs actually start twitching because it ruins their their muscles. Um, can't relax. Um, often, if you're if you're smoking too much of a e-vape cigarette and your eye might might start twitching, you're getting that same experience of how um, nicotine can also kill insects. Um, there's also um, organic bio pesticides that are biological, like fungal-based or bacterial-based fungicides um, that are not chemicals. Um, it's just um, a pure fungus. Usually it's grown and created in some kind of powder or solid form that you can mix into water or apply directly. Um, Bovaria bassiana is a fungus that um, eats the inside of an insect. Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT for short, is a bacteria. And um, these, these biological organisms only kill insects. So it's seen to be very safe for humans and mammals because it only targets insects. However, all of these insecticides, even the organic biological based insecticides are called broad spectrum. And that means they're gonna kill any insect, including honeybees, including your good bugs, like your predatory um, natural predators are gonna eat your pests for you. You're gonna kill them. So a lot of farmers, they will get a pest, they spray an insecticide, they end up killing all of the predators that would naturally eat the pests and what happens is your insects actually, um, their populations boom after the initial destruction of the insecticide. So you might have your pest population here, you spray, they initially go down, but then they actually increase even more than, than before because you killed their natural enemies. And then forevermore, you're basically relying upon the insecticide. And it's very hard to go back to using more sustainable um, natural predator methods after using an insecticide. So um, even organic insecticides can harm honeybees and be an issue. Um, and of course, there are also other pesticides like fungicides. There are a lot of fungus or fungi that attack and eat plants, um, especially if you live um, on the East Coast where it can be very humid and very wet. You're going to have some kind of mold and you have to save your crop. If you've already spent two months growing your tomato plants and they get a fungus, as a farmer, you can't afford to not spray a fungicide to save your crops. You've already spent so much time and so much effort and invested so much money into your getting your crop this to this level that you have to spray. And then there's also herbicides, which kill plants and weeds, um, which is um, extremely common. Um, so the next slide, um, the most common herbicide is known as Roundup. Many of you probably already know about Roundup. The active ingredient is known as glyphosate. 
And so Roundup is broad spectrum for plants. It will kill any plant, including your crop. Um, and it works slowly, so it works really effectively. So you'll spray it and the plant won't die for two weeks. What happens is the chemical leaches into the leaves. You want to, we want to apply it to the leaves, not the soil. And the chemical translocates to every part of the plant. It's going to go down the stem and to every root. And then it kills it once it's gone, up to, gone to the entire plant. So it actually works um, really well, even though it works slowly. However, Roundup has been linked to a lot of diseases like non-Hodgkin lymphoma, kidney disease, liver damage, even cancer. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a really publicized lawsuit of a man who accidentally spilled Roundup on his hand and wrist and ended up getting cancer. And I think he got like something like $200 million in the in the lawsuit settlement um, from Monsanto. So that was a huge thing. Um, since then, Bayer has bought out Monsanto. So um, it's even a, a larger company as well. Um, and Roundup has also been studied. Um, it, well, it's very toxic to aquatic life. That is on the label. It can also leach into the groundwater and it does persist for a long time. It does not break down quickly. Um, and it has been measured in all kinds of food items, even organic food items um, and some drinking water can have very small levels of glyphosate because it's so pervasive and used so commonly that it ends up um, somehow everywhere in all these food sources. So it's it's kind of scary, um, but I want to explain um, how Roundup is used in the next slide. Um, so Roundup Ready is a technology that was created um, in the 80s. And what it does is it allows you to spray the herbicide on your entire field, but it does not kill your crops. Your crops are herbicide resistant. So, I mean, I'm sure many of you have weeded a garden before, right? If you've ever done any weeding in your garden, you know it takes a lot of time, a lot of labor. If you don't pull your weeds, your weeds are going to take over and your plants are not going to get enough water or nutrition or sunlight. So you have to get rid of your weeds in order to grow anything intentionally. And hand pulling weeds is really expensive, right? Labor is a top um, uh, top cost for a lot of farmers. So they can't have laborers just pulling weeds in their fields. So this, this technology um, made food cheap. This is one reason why food is so cheap nowadays and that people can actually afford um, food, because afford, afford stable foods at such low prices because farmers are able to reduce their prices because of this technology. So instead of having to pull every weed, you spray your whole field and your weeds die, but your crop does not die. So if you're driving around and you see a corn or soy field and there's not a single weed in the field or along the edges and all the edge, all the edge plants are totally dead, you can be 100% sure that's herbicide. There's no other way to get every weed out of a 100 acre farm without herbicides. It's insanely common. I mean, it's literally down the road from my house. I can tell that these corn and soy fields um, are using Roundup. So in the next slide, um, this leads to our discussion of GMOs. So um, you all know GMO stands for genetically modified organism, but that term is very misleading. It was actually coined by a journalist and scientists actually refer to it as transgenic. And I'll explain why. And this image is an example of the how media can really mislead uh, what GMOs are and how they're used, right? This image is just a syringe going into an apple, right? That's not how it works. <laughs> um, and there's also a lot of um, difference between like the um, organic and conventional food and then the GMO food, right? So there's a lot of food that's in between organic and GMO. There's a lot of food that's not GMO that's also not organic. And that's a very common mis misconception I'm going to use as well. A lot of people say that they, that they don't like GMOs, that they want to buy organic to avoid GMOs but they're not really sure why. They might say, oh, well, there's all those lawsuits about farmers, right? If a farmer um, is neighboring a farmer who has GMOs, that those farmers were getting a lot of lawsuits. Um, that was several years ago. That's not really happening anymore. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss the fact that genes of the GMOs can travel as well. But let me explain first um, how GMOs could be misleading. So my next slide, um, I explained that um, genetic modification is totally natural, right? Whenever you have a child or a, an, an organism is reproducing and, and creates offspring, 
those genetics had a chance to recombine with the mother and father's genetics to create a very unique individual. So every time somebody is born, anything is born, they are modifying their genes. There are new genes that are created. Um, and a really good example was um, a lot of brassica vegetables uh, were all naturally bred from a wild mustard plant. So um, natural breeding is a way that farmers and growers change the genes to get a, a, a result that they want um, just by natural breeding. So for example, if I want a cabbage and I find this wild mustard and one of the plants is, is getting kind of like this nice head-like bunch of leaves and I like the way that tastes. And so I'm gonna continue to select every year for the crop that's getting tighter and tighter heads of leaves until I have something that I can call a cabbage. And then vice versa, I might find one that has white flower buds and I can call it cauliflower or one that has really big buds that I call broccoli. And they also made kale out of that. So all of those crops never used to exist thousands of years ago. Humans actually bred and selected um, for these um, modifications in genes that just happened naturally out of um, natural selection or um, crossbreeding. For example, if I want an orange tomato, I can take a red tomato and a yellow tomato, um, cross pollinate them and then take the seeds from that fruit um, and plant all of them and hope that one of those plants had the genetic modification that I was seeking that allows for an orange tomato. I've successfully recombined and uh, modified the genes without any kind of GMO, what we call a GMO technology. So next slide, what are GMOs then? If they're not just naturally selected, it's not just any old modification of genes. Um, the, the word transgenic is the best way to explain it, right? We're actually taking genes um, and transferring them to an organism that would not otherwise naturally reproduce with those genes. So, um, for example, um, one of the one of the best stories is the um, Bt corn, right? So I mentioned the Bacillus thuringiensis bacteria is um, a bacteria that naturally creates a toxin. It's called the Cry One A B toxin that kills insects. You can't actually spray the bacteria as an insecticide. But scientists have taken the DNA of that bacteria and just isolated the part of the genes that create that toxin that kills the insect. And then they open up the DNA of the corn and they insert the DNA of the bacteria. So corn and bacteria would never be able to reproduce. But in a lab where we have chemicals that can splice the DNA and we're able to take the DNA that we want and input it into the, into the target DNA, um, we're able to create this transgenic organism where um, the, the modification of genes would never happen naturally. And so basically um, they do this in a Petri dish with a little bit of plant tissue. And then that plant tissue is nursed and grown to a whole plant. And that whole plant grows as normal. It produces, uh, you know, the fruit or the corn that is the seed that you can then harvest and dry and, and plant and regrow. So now you have seeds with this new um, genetic code. It doesn't look any different, doesn't taste any different, but it's now um, displaying the bacterial DNA or toxin. And so the Bt corn is um, basically immune to um, insect damage. So um, moths and caterpillars, also known as the Lepidoptera family, um, are a huge issue in corn. It's, they're literally called corn borers. And it's the larva of a moth that eats the corn kernels. And so when you go to harvest your corn at the end of the season, it's completely gone and eaten already. So it's a huge issue. And so the BT corn, the insect will take a, take a bite of the corn and it gets this weird feeling in its stomach or it might even kill it and it's not gonna eat or touch that corn ever again. And so what, what's actually interesting is that this, this BT toxin now is no longer um, affecting you. It's not affecting your non-target bugs because um, they're not trying to eat your corn, um, right? You're not having to spray the insecticide over your whole field because your plant is exhibiting it automatically. Um, and that means that you're, you don't have to spray. Um, so a lot of sprays will drift away from your field and can land onto school or neighborhoods or people's houses and lawns, but the BT corn allows you to not have to spray. Um, so next slide, transgenic technology um, was developed actually in the 90s. 
um, and they used it to solve all kinds of issues, not just insects, but also um, the herbicide resistant crops or the Roundup Ready crops um, and other disease problems, even to help with shelf life and things. And so they basically um, put millions of dollars to create this um, designer DNA that they can't generate um, of natural selection, but it does require a lot of testing before approval, of course. Um, and so there's a lot of experiments going on, but it takes a lot to actually get a new transgenic um, product onto the market. There's only about 50 that have been approved for the market. There's only about 10 or 11 that are actually commonly grown and that you would find in your supermarket. So the next slide, it shows, this is a huge common misconception, right? Everybody thinks, oh, if I'm gonna eat this, you know, this garlic, it might be GMO, I have to buy organic. You have to buy organic everything, that's not true. It's actually pretty easy to avoid GMOs without buying everything organic. And that's because these are the 11 crops that are at your grocery store um, available as GMO. Of course, corn um, and soy are one of the top GMO crops. However, most of the GMO corn and soy is going to cattle. Um, so it's very like tofu can easily be found in or, or as an organic option in pretty much every store that I've seen. Um, so it's very common to grow corn and soybean that is not GMO for human consumption. Um, they did do a GMO papaya, and that's because there was a disease in Hawaii where they just, they couldn't grow it at all. And the only solution they could find was using the transgenic technology to make a disease resistant papaya, um, right? And that like saved the papaya industry. Summer squash um, was produced in 1995. Um, so it's been around for a while as a GMO. But it's just not that common. A lot for farmers, you know, if you can grow squash without having to pay the premium for GMO, then, you know, you're not going to have to 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 go with a GMO option. Um, so sweet corn, um, it, it has been transgenic um, alterations for um, the Roundup Ready, as well as the insecticide BT that is currently present in sweet corn. Um, sugar beets is one of them. So sugar cane is not GMO. There's no sugar cane that's GMO, but sugar beets are often processed and um, made into sugar. Also, as we, as you know, high fructose corn syrup is huge and in every sweet product, um, and that's probably GMO as well. Cotton is a huge one. So if you're wearing any kind of cotton shirt that's not organic, it's, it's likely to be GMO cotton. Um, canola is a big one, although um, I've seen some recent articles that it's not used very frequently. Um, but canola oil is similar to um, broccoli or, or mustard. It's in the brassica family and it's used for cooking oil most commonly. Um, now the potato and apple were both very recent transgenic technologies that were approved. Um, of course, the apple, it, it's it takes a long time to grow an apple um, from a tree. So um, I don't believe that a lot of apples in the store are GMO. So again, there's a big middle room but before, you know, that are not organic, that are not GMO, that are just traditionally cultivated, but not GMO and not organic. So you don't have to be afraid. Every part of the grocery store might have GMO in it, might have GMO technology in it, or transgenic would be the proper term. Um, and a lot of the GMO technology is, um, to address specific problems or to feed cattle. I do want to talk about, um, oh, my next slide, I just have some more images. Oh, I want to talk about the non-GMO label. You might have seen the verified non-GMO, and it's always funny when you see, um, for example, a portobello mushroom um, certified as non-GMO. Well, there are no transgenic mushrooms, so there's no possible way of there being a GMO portobello mushroom. But of course, it's very easy to get the approval then to stamp that on there and say, oh, this mushroom's verified non-GMO. Um, customers fall for it. They're like, oh, that's good, because then this conventional mushroom might be GMO, but that's not even true. So I think this is, this, this is really important to know and can really um, potentially um, ease your anxiety around shopping if you're trying to avoid GMOs. So there has been some research um, that the bacteria in the BET corn can get into your stomach and cause issues with your um, microflora in your gut. Um, but of course, there's not enough research to take these items off the market, right? They have been studied immensely and approved as safe. Um, but of course, there is some research going out there that there are issues. 
but people have been eating GMOs for years and there haven't been enough evidence of there being huge issues. So, you know, these have, and, and in fact, GMO crops are studied and approved um, more um, strictly than normal food. So um, it, some can argue that it's actually safer. Um, some people actually do argue that. Um, but in, this, in the next slide, I'm showing the um, prevalence of GMOs. So you can see, um, and these numbers have actually increased since this graph was made. So typically it's about 98% of soybeans. This graph says 94, um, but it's like 94 to 98% of soybeans are transgenic. Same with corn. So again, if you see a corn or soy field, you can be 95% sure that it's a GMO field, that those are GMO crops. A lot of sugar beets, um, canola, and cotton are the most common, right? So although there is a GMO squash, there is a GMO potato, those, those are not common. Not a lot of growers are using it. In fact, when they came out with a GMO potato, um, McDonald's and Burger King refused um, to use it. Um, and Monsanto actually lost a lot of money um, developing the transgenic potato because farmers and growers and customers didn't want it because there's so much fear and consumer demand to decrease GMOs, um, that product d d was not successful. So um, it's just really good to know these crops are called agronomic crops, right? They're not vegetables. They're really done in industrial farming, right? So your corn and soy, mainly for cattle, your sugar beets for your sweets, um, corn for high fructose corn syrup, and of course your oil and fabric. So those crops that have to be grown in large amounts are typically what is um because it's worth it to do this transgenic technology because you're growing hundreds or thousands of acres of these crops typical vegetables there's almost no transgenic vegetables in the grocery store very very small amounts so the next slide just to summarize um gmos are not all bad so you can understand that they do make food cheaper it can help with better shelf life um, you know, it helps farmers and, um, and grocery stores to make more money because their food is not going bad as fast. It makes it easier to grow, allows them to spray less. So there's actually a lot of environmental um, save saviors, I guess, in, in using transgenic technology. It's also tested more. Um, in fact, the corn borer insect that eats corn can uh, harbor and um, put actual toxins in the corn that are carcinogenic. So the fact um, that we're destroying the ability for the insect to get to the corn with the BT technology, there is a way that we're actually making the corn safer for the GMO technology. So that's good to know. Next slide, though, I want to discuss this um, specific story with GMO potatoes, right? So this was um, developed in 2016 um, and it got approved um, and it's available on the market. Does not mean that every farmer is switching to the GMO potato, but basically the potato um, transgenic technology um, prevents blight. Right, which is a huge issue. There was a potato blight famine, um, you know, years ago. Um, it also prevents bruising and browning, so that helps the potato to have a better shelf life, um, and it sells easier. However, um, further studies showed that the bruises were just made invisible, and they still happen, and they can still um, decrease the quality of the food. And the blight can also overcome um, the transgenic technology just through natural evolution. Um, as, as well, there were um, more neurotoxins that they found. So the researcher actually admitted that he was wrong. So he developed the transgenic potato. Wow, it reduces bruising. Um, it got approved and on the market. And he kept researching it and later found oh no, the bruises are really just invisible. And actually somehow they didn't expect it to, it increased these other um, toxins that affect our neurosystem when we eat them. So these are this is an example of the unintended consequences of the transgenic technology because they can change the expression of other genes that we may not have expected. And these can also have very long-term effects that we don't notice right away in the research and approval process. So that can be really scary. This researcher now says that he regrets researching and developing the transgenic potato and he's publishing saying i wish i could take it off the market but he doesn't have that power anymore it's now beyond the scientists and goes on to the um capitalists who are making money from it so um that's a really sad story um that that is concerning and, and the next slide talks about an issue with corn so a very common concern with transgenic transgenic technology is that the genes might travel through pollen, also called genetic drift, and that it can affect other plants. 
this doesn't really happen all that much because um, there's not a lot of wild weeds that are related to crops. Like there's no wild corn out there. There are canola is probably the most concerning because there are a lot of wild um, mustard still out there growing. But a lot of crops um, are not wild, right? You're not seeing wild uh, squash growing around. Um, so it's not a lot of genetic drift. However, there was genetic drift um, as an example a few years ago they developed a new transgenic technology um, that was only meant for corn for animal feed. Um, and because corn is wind pollinated, so this photo is showing um, the tuft of the corn where the pollen is released and that blows in the wind to pollinate the kernels of the corn. Um, so those genes were drifting in the wind and um, got drifted onto nearby a field of corn that was meant for human consumption. And it actually caused a lot of allergic reactions, right? The technology was known not to be safe for humans, and that's why it was used for animal feed only, um, except those genes drifted into the um, human food corn. In fact, my stepbrother, he has a lot of allergies, and he suddenly became allergic to corn, and they didn't understand why. And then, if, and then after about a year later, um, he was no longer allergic to corn. Um, and, and then only recently that we see, oh, that was literally caused by a genetic drift issue. Um, so it is happening um, and it is concerning and it is creating a safety concern in our food supply. Um, but really the, the largest concern with, with GMOs is herbicide resistant weeds, um, which occur without genetic drift. So the next slide, um, basically explains that even one application of herbicide, commonly Roundup, um, on your Roundup ready field of corn, um, if one weed survives that spray, particularly on the edge, maybe they didn't get like a full application of herbicide, they survive and then they quickly develop resistance. And that can happen just in one application in one season. And then of course that plant survives, it goes to seed, and those thousands of seeds it produced are now resistant to the herbicide. So then when, next year you're a farmer, you spray your Roundup Ready crops with Roundup, but now there's all these weeds showing up and the Roundup no longer works. And that's actually one of the biggest issues with farmers using transgenic technology, that it's no longer working. Um, so they quickly developed um, a duo product. So instead of Roundup Ready, you have Roundup Duo. Um, and it uses more than just the glyphosate Roundup chemical. It also uses another herbicide to make sure that you are killing those weeds that are resistant. And you can guess that has happened again. And now they're developing a trio product that includes three different herbicide chemicals just so you can kill those herbicide resistant weeds. In fact, this is already happening very fast, faster than scientists can develop the new um, resistance technology for their transgenic crops or faster than we can develop new herbicide chemicals. So this is a really big concern for farmers, um, but it, it, it's hard to get rid of weeds otherwise, right? If you're not using um, the transgenic herbicide resistant technology, when you spray um, an herbicide, it, it can kill your crop. Um, and so, you know, otherwise they have like smart technology, tractors actually can like see which plant is a weed and which plant is a crop and can just kill that one. The, right? There's so much that farmers go through just to remove weeds. Of course, this technology is by far the easiest and cheapest. And the fact that it's not working anymore is a huge concern for farmers. However, we think of pesticides mainly as an issue on our food. But I'd like to bring up um, that pesticides are actually a lot closer to home than you might think. So in this next slide, I'm talking about herbicides that are right underneath our feet, even at home on turf grass. So um, turf, grass, turf grass is um, you know, really prevalent, um, especially in, in suburbs, um, even on George Mason's campus, um, right? Lawns are just we love it. In America, we love having that beautiful grass that's weed free. And the only way that we have beautiful weed free grass is with herbicides. So there's an herbicide known as 2,4-D um, and it only kills dicots, meaning non grass plants. So you can actually cover your grass with it, even if it's not herbicide resistant grass, and it's not going to die from the 2,4-D herbicide. So this herbicide is extremely common. There were 40 million pounds of it sold in 2013, just in that one year alone. Pretty much anytime you see a beautiful, perfect lawn that has no weeds, you can be 
pretty confident that that someone sprayed 2,4-D on that lawn to kill the weeds. Um, it was also used as one of two chemicals in Agent Orange during Vietnam War. So the other um, product, um, I think it's 245T, yes, um, has been confirmed to cause a lot of issues like prostate cancer um, and other diseases. Um, in fact, my grandfather who fought in Vietnam War was covered in Agent Orange and now he's been fighting cancer for years um, directly because of it. So 245T is available on the market because it's very toxic. Although 24D is still available on the market, it's seen as a, a safe enough to, to use um, consistently. So they typically spray it multiple times every season, but otherwise you get weeds growing in your lawn and those weeds can go to seed and spread and cause issues. Some of those weeds um, might be nauseous weeds. They're gonna spread and take over. So uh, unfortunately, to have a nice lawn, you're pretty much are, you're going to rely on applying fertilizer and applying uh, herbicide. And typically those are combined as a weed and feed um, one application. So you're feeding it with fertilizer and you're also killing off the weeds with that herbicide. Um, now, of course, when it rains, all these chemicals are also washed away into the stormwater, into the groundwater, causing further issues. So you might say, you know, in this lecture, um, you know, in, in life that, oh, pesticides on food is a huge issue, that stormwater from agriculture is a huge issue. However, lawns are also a huge issue. Um, and in fact, 2,4-D, some studies um, in, in rats have shown that it can cause muscle weakness, um, depression, and anxiety. I even cancer, um, but it's very difficult to do research on humans, right? You have to get a lot of approvals. You wouldn't want to put a human at risk by putting 2,4-D directly on them. So it's very difficult and especially um, symptoms like anxiety and depression are really difficult to, um, to study in, in humans because there could be so many other factors causing those is issues. You can't just say that it's this one product that you've applied. So it's very complicated to make these arguments, um, but it is pretty scary. 2,4-D has been shown um, to track on the bottoms of your shoes. It can absorb through inhalation, through your skin. I've heard a lot of people getting eye irritation and lung irritation, walking by people who are spraying the lawns. You know, it's viewed as so safe and there's no regulations to um, advertise when or what they spray. So basically, if you see a lawn that looks nice and there's no weeds, be careful. You don't want to roll around on that lawn. I've actually heard from athletes who, um, you know, were on the lawn rolling around doing an athletic exercise and got a huge rash um, and never had a rash from grass before. And it's just from these chemicals. So be really careful on grasses. Um, in the next slide, I'm showing the alternative. You know, or weedy lawns, right? You can still mow the lawn and have this um, short plant growth that allows you to walk and enjoy, you know, beautiful fields and lawns without herbicides. Um, it's mainly an aesthetic and cultural issue, right? In America, there's like this competition between the suburb dads to have the perfect, beautiful green lawn. And what does it say if your lawn is dead and doesn't look good or it's full of weeds? Um, I'm not sure how we can change that culture, but um, just by education, I think is the best thing I can do. A lot of these weeds that are super common are actually edible or medicinal. Um, dandelion, um, the whole part is edible. The root can be made into tea. The leaves can be eaten like a salad green, actually cooked dandelion greens are delicious with just a little bit of vinegar and salt. If you haven't tried it, really good. Just make sure you're harvesting it from a lawn that's not sprayed in herbicide. So not typically a public park lawn, but a home lawn. Um, and really, if you're seeing a lot of weeds like this image in a lawn, you can be really confident that there are no herbicides on it. And this lawn is healthy, right? It's There's diversity of plants. There, um, the, the clover flowers you see are supporting pollinators. It's helping the ecology. There's gonna be less stormwater runoff. There's gonna be deeper roots. There's gonna be more life in that soil. Um, it's gonna pr uh, reduce pollution. You actually don't need to apply as much fertilizer to the lawn when it has this diversity. Um, there have been studies with, um, they've developed a micro clover. So it's a version of clover. You can use it um, as 30% of your lawn seed along with your grass, and it helps to make them greener during the winter times, requires less fertilizer. Clover actually fix nitrogen as they grow. So they're actually feeding your grass as they're growing. Um, and the micro clover is just very small. They have tiny little flowers. So it's a, a barely any difference um, aesthetically as well. So there are um, really 
easy alternatives to, to make lawns more safe as well. But it's not just our food. Um, lawns are also an issue for um, fertilizer pollution and for pesticides as well. So next slide, moving on, I just have a summary here. We looked at the land use and ecology, the stormwater. We we're looking at insects, insecticides, how they can affect bee populations. We discussed GMO crops, um, how fertilizers can impact greenhouse gases. Of course, the emissions from the machines. Um, I didn't even go into chemical production, but there are so many chemicals, like hundreds of thousands of chemicals in the U.S. that are used for food. A lot of them are actually byproducts. Um, you know, if you if you have this industrial process that has this waste item, they pay a scientist to figure out what it does. And you can think, oh, it creates an emulsifier. It combines the water and the fat and the food and then they approve it and it's used as food. It's not hard to find chemicals in your food. Really read any label and there's all kinds of numbers and code names that are very scientific, but you don't know what it is. Um, so even food that's not um, agricultural based um, can be really harmful for our health and for the atmosphere. Um, I don't even talk yet about waste, right? There's so much food that ends up going to waste, even in my fridge. I mean, even I'm to blame for some food waste. It's impossible to have a, a supply of fresh food without having some of it go bad. And especially at restaurants where they always need every item on the menu, fresh and ready to go. If it doesn't get eaten, it goes to waste, um, especially food safety concerns. Um, you know, if it's past the expiration date at a grocery store, they have to throw it out. And they're actually not allowed to donate expired food um, because there's a liability, right? If they donate it and then somebody gets sick because it wasn't good anymore, um, then that company can get sued. So there's a lot of fear around donating um, food at grocery stores. I know a lot of people who live off of dumpster diving <laughs> because there's so much food that, that goes to waste, um, all from the fear of, of getting sued and the, and the need for uh, risk management and, and reducing liability. So, um, oh, and not even to mention all the packaging for food, right? It's impossible to go to the grocery store, supply your ingredients without having some kind of plastic film that's not recyclable that has to go in the trash. Um, but especially takeout food, um, styrofoam packaging, there's so much waste that comes out of food. Um, so I have another question for you. What percentage of food in the US do you think goes to waste? Not even the, the packaging, but just the actual edible food parts. What percentage of food do you think ends up going to waste? 65%. Good guess, 30%, 40%. Yes, all good guesses, right? It's a huge amount. So if you go to the next slide, it's estimated that 40%, so a lot of you were, were really close, 40% of all food made in the US ends up going to waste. Um, in fact, food waste is considered the single largest material sent to landfills, um, which is just devastating because we know that this food could be composted doesn't have to go to the landfill. Um, and there's a lot more percentage of the waste that is um, the packaging of food as well. Um, that's a lot of single use packaging too. Um, but there's estimated to be about $161 billion of uneaten food that goes to waste. So it, it's huge and it happens on the farm. If the, product, if the produce is not perfect and good looking, it won't sell or sometimes it gets stepped on or crushed during um, harvest or transportation, if it goes bad on the shelf at the grocery store or at the restaurant, and then it even goes bad in your fridge. So at every stage of the process, there's a huge opportunity for waste uh, and, and it's a huge issue. So next slide, I wanna move on to the more positive part of our lecture because this um, environmental impact of agriculture can be reduced. And you can guess by the images here, what can we do to reduce the impact? A huge thing that people can do is actually gardening and growing their own food. So the next slide, it shows local food production um, or urban gardening is a huge thing you can do to reduce these environmental impacts, right? It's going to avoid all of those issues I talked about, all that intensive farming, the transportation, all those chemicals and things that you, you don't have to use when you're gardening at home. Um, you can also compost your waste. And of course, it's healthier for you. Eating more vegetables, um, it, it's healthier for you. There's less chemicals, there's less processing. You can guarantee that there are no pesticides in the food. Um, it, 
it can make a huge impact. So next slide. Um, if you do have any space either outside in your lawn or inside your home um, to grow at home, it can, it can make a huge difference. Um, it can be pretty simple and easy. You'd actually be surprised even if you just plant one seed next to the maybe the landscaped shrubs um, by your apartment, you'd be surprised how much food can come out of that one seed. You can get multiple heads of zucchini and squash that didn't have to be transported. You know they're not GMOs. Um, and I will add, when you buy seeds, there's no way that you're accidentally going to buy a GMO. I get this question all the time. I'm like, oh, look at this really cool white pumpkin that, that we should grow. They're like, wait, it could be a GMO. And it's like, no, you're never going to accidentally buy a GMO. If you're buying GMO seeds, you're doing it intentionally because you're an industrial farmer and you're trying to save money and you're looking into the technology. Um, any kind of seed catalog or homegrown vegetables, none of those are going to be GMO and you're not going to accidentally buy GMOs. You don't have to worry about that when you're buying seeds to grow food. So that's good to know. And you'll be surprised that once you start growing food, that there's an abundance of it and it's free as well. If you grow it, you don't have to pay for it. There's no packaging. Um, there's little to no waste coming out of it. Um, there's so many health and well-being benefits as well. So the next slide, there are so many studies that are showing um, when people grow their own food, it improves their diet choices. Basically, a lot of people don't value produce. They don't realize how much work goes into it. Um, you know, apples and oranges, they just get thrown in like trash, like, oh, it's just an apple, just an orange. But if you knew that that tree took 10 to 20 years to grow, all the days that the farmer had to wake up early and spray it to keep it from dying or, you know, keep a pest infestation at bay, um, all the transportation. I mean, there's so much that goes into our food. And once you start growing food and learning that, your diet choices are going to change. Um, in fact, since I've been growing food, especially leafy greens for years, I crave eating salads. I love eating raw leaves and leafy greens, vegetables. If I've been eating bread or like sweets and things, like I really crave just eating some like spinach or like just some lettuce on, on even on its own. Um, so, you know, if you don't like raw vegetables now, if you start just trying to grow, especially if you eat fresh food. I had a revelation when I first started growing on campus as a, as a student, as a freshman, I had no idea about gardening. I was like, all right, I never buy kale, but I grew it. I should try it. And it was amazing. Like raw kale is amazing. Raw asparagus fresh out of the ground is incredible. Raw asparagus from the store is already like weeks old, not very good raw. You usually would cook it. Raw food straight off of the plant is like nothing else. The flavor and the nutrition that you're getting from fresh food is incredible and far outweighs anything in the store. Produce at the grocery store is designed for shelf life. It's designed to last as long as possible. It's designed to look nice. It's designed to um, make some profit margin for the farmer, for the trucker, for the packager, for the manufacturer, for every worker along that entire chain. So they're just trying to get it to last as long as um, getting purchased by the end consumer. So there's so much more flavor when you grow food at home. Um, it has shown to reduce allergies as well. Um, it can increase well-being, being outside and growing. Even just looking at a tree or looking at a green plant for a few seconds has shown to um, reduce depression and anxiety um, and increase well-being. It can make a huge impact. Um, community gardening brings a lot of communities together. Um, it can create a sense of belonging as well in a, in a community. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get involved on campus, of course, with our campus gardens. Once we're back up and running, we can show you how to grow food and get the experience um, in any community garden, um, just helping and volunteering before you can make the commitment um, to home gardening. If, if you're apprehensive, you can try it by volunteering first. So the next slide, I do want to tell you um, to grow your own food, you want to have hope. A lot of people tell me, oh, everything I plant just dies. I don't have a green thumb. I can't grow anything. I tell them, well, yeah, if you plant a seed and say, it's just going to die. I can't grow anything. That seed actually absorbs that energy. And that's what it's telling itself, that it's not going to grow and it's going to die. So when you plant a seed, just give it some hope. 
human intention is actually really powerful. And um, there are some, there's actually a lot of studies out there um, that plants um, sense human intent and emotion. Um, and they can grow better when you give them positive messaging, right? If you tell a seed, I love you, you're going to grow and be so beautiful. And I believe in you and you're going to grow and you're going to feed me this beautiful food. That plant's thinking, yes, I have a purpose. I'm going to feed someone. I'm going to grow. And it actually makes a huge difference. I tell all my volunteers to in, imbue the seeds with love and positivity as they grow them. It's going to help you um, as well as the plants. I've, I've seen the difference, I will tell you. Also, when you're gardening, the more you put in, the more you'll get out, right? So if you're checking on your plants every day, if you're pulling some weeds here and there, noticing maybe the they're turning yellow and you can add some fertilizer oh they're wilting to water them the more frequently you check your garden um, the better it's going to be and of course the more time and effort you put into it the more you'll get out of it but even just planting a seed like gorilla planting anywhere just get that seed in the ground i you know it, it you will get inhibited constantly if you think oh someday or you know later it's not a good time you know maybe i'll plant it later it's not warm enough just have some hope and get those seeds in the ground or in that tray or in that pot of old soil in your basement because you'll be surprised every time how resilient nature is like wow it's growing wow i can eat it already um and it can change your life because it really did mine and i get i i'm constantly inspired by plants and when i ever get down in the dumps i just connect with nature and i look at plants and i spend time with them and i feel better because nature will always keep growing will always keep going. Even the invasive weeds, they're still going and taking over the poorest of soil, growing in the crack of the sidewalk. I could go on and on. You also wanna grow smart. So it's good to know what to plant when. For example, some plants are tolerant of frost while others are more sensitive. Um, for example, you don't wanna put your tomatoes in the ground until late April, like right about now is the perfect time to plant tomatoes. Um, but um, peas, cabbage, beets are all frost tolerant. You can plant them in the fall and they'll grow all winter. Carrots and radish and things um, you can plant in February as well, even if it's freezing cold and snowy. Kale, Swiss chard, they're so resistant to being covered in snow, to being to growing in the freezing cold, to growing all winter. Um, onion chives, are they, they just grow all winter and they're beautiful and green. So just, you know, growing smart can definitely help you to save time and do it properly as well. But a lot of this information is all over the website, all over, you know, websites in general, um, in the library, um, or just through your own experimentation and trial and error. Sometimes that's the best way to learn. In the next slide, um, if you are doing any kind of home gardening or community gardening, it's also good to preserve your food, right? We live in a temperate environment here in Virginia. We can't grow our food all year round. So um, canning is actually having a resurgence in our culture now. It's kind of an old fashioned thing. Um, you can either get a pressure canner or just a pot of hot water and you can can um, fruits. Like if you have a fruit tree and you have a huge, huge harvest, you can can them and that way um, that food is shelf stable without any refrigeration. If your freezer is already running, you can stock it full of your um, homegrown food drying as well you can get drying machines or you can dry in the sun on 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 dry days um, and that preserves them makes them shelf life or you can do indoor production which allows you to do it year round in a heated space as well um, so next slide i do want to go over um, a few more tips if you want to do any gardening um, what will give you success the number one way to have healthy plants in a successful garden is healthy soil they say if you feed your soil you will feed your plant and you will feed you and your family. But you have to feed the soil first. If you don't have healthy soil, you're not gonna have healthy plants or healthy food. Um, so organic matter is super important. Um, and growers often call it OM or O-M for short. It is like super important. Um, constantly add organic matter to your to your garden beds. You can't build a garden bed and expect the soil to, to be good every season. You constantly have to add organic material um, or fertilizer or compost um, to be able to keep that soil alive and continue feeding it naturally and organically. Um, so, of course, composting. If you're starting a bed, you can actually just um, cover it in food scraps and paper, or like raw compost, um, and then over the winter, and then by the spring, all that compost is broken 
down as you know it's a source of organic matter and is now a healthy soil bed that you can put plants in after a few months um, and what all this organic matter is going to do it's going to feed your microbial diversity right all those bacteria fungi beneficial nematodes worms and insects are actually helping your plants um, in fact, fungi, 90% um, of fungi create mycorrhizal relationships or mycorrhizal interactions with plants. It's super cool. I could go on about it forever, but really quick, mycorrhizal fungi actually trade goods with a plant. So they wrap around or go inside the plant root because um, fungi mainly live as roots or mycelium and they trade goods. So the plant gives the fungus sugar because they can photosynthesize and create sugar. And in return, the fungi are going to give the plant water, nutrients, whatever it needs. Fungi are some of the largest organisms on our planet. They can cover miles of forest floor. And if the plant needs some iron or needs some sulfur, whatever it is, that fungi can pull it from miles away and actually carry it and give it to the plant. So there's so much evidence that by growing plants with mycorrhizal fungi, which you can't see, they're just underground growing. It's not like a bunch of mushrooms are popping up. Just mycorrhizal spores you add to your soil or that are wild, you know, just wild already present in your soil. And you'll get like double the growth, like without mycorrhizae, with mycorrhizae. It makes like a huge difference. Um, there's also a lot of symbiotic bacteria as well that can help to fix nitrogen um, that are gonna feed your plant. Um, plants just really can't live on their own with sterile soil. They truly rely on this community in their roots um, the the rhizosphere um, as I as I like to call it is that realm underneath the ground in the soil and that's where most of the action is happening for the plant they're doing photosynthesis and sunlight but pretty much everything else is down in the roots and you need to have healthy soil so um, mulching is really important um, you don't have to till actually no tilling is better because you don't kill all your off your worms and your mycorrhizal um, structures and cover crops you never want to have bare soil so in this next slide um, here are 10 permaculture strategies for regenerating soil um, and if you want to learn more about permaculture, tomorrow I'm giving a talk about the food forest and I'll go more into permaculture then. But permaculture is a way to grow food um, in, in more permanent ways sustainably and regenerating soil is one of those top methods. Um, so absolutely zero bare soil is your number one tip. So by cover cropping, you can do like a cover crop of um, clover or of like winter rye over the winter, um, just something to keep your soil covered so that your microbes in your soil always have root to on and interact with. Um, and that way there's no gases releases from your soil. There is no um, stormwater runoff where your, water, where your soil just gets washed away. Um, so cover crops, um, even industrial farmers do cover cropping techniques, um, truly, truly effective. Um, you can also do a chop and drop where you chop the cover crop and just let it drop and so it decays and adds that organic material like dead grass and stuff. Um, sheet mulching is a great technique. If you want to start a garden in your lawn, you can put cardboard over the grass and then do mulch in layers, kind of like a lasagna. You might do like some compost, some leaf mulch, some wood chip mulch, um, and that sheet mulching technique kill the grass and create a new bed right away or after a season of sitting there. Um, you can also um, you know, add compostables, like I said. You can actually buy and spray or apply probiotics like the mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria directly into your soil. Um, there, so there's so many methods, but if you feed your soil, you will feed plants. So next slide, um, I, I just wanna add in there that we do have gardens on campus. We can learn all these things hands-on. Typically when we're running the gardens, you, anybody can volunteer for free and start learning these methods and learning hands-on as well. Next slide, microgreens at home. I want to get through the slides quickly. I was hoping to end at 4.30, but I do want to mention um, if you have not heard of microgreens, um, you definitely want to try them because they are super quick and easy. In fact, radish microgreens, like the ones pictured, grow in just six days. So they're very fast, very cheap, um, and super nutritious. Um, and you can, the seeds are just like any normal seeds. I have uh, um, a good source here, Johnny Selected Seeds. We buy our microgreen seeds for the greenhouse there. Um, speaking of greenhouse, next slide, we do um, 
have a hydroponic greenhouse on campus where we produce um, microgreens hydroponically. So here's an image of me actually picking up the hydroponic microgreen um, we grow in burlap and we actually are able to harvest and prune them vertically, which um, saves space. So it's more um, it's more sustainable because you can fit a lot more food in small space. And microgreens do not need a lot of light or fertilizer, so you can really easily grow them in your kitchen. Next slide. I'm going to have to breeze through these slides really quickly. Um, but hydroponics is a method of growing food without soil. Um, and the water is recaptured and recirculated, so there's no weeding. Um, it uses significantly less water. It's at waist height, so it's very easy to maintain. Um, and overall, it's sustainable for all those reasons. Next slide. It can also save a ton of space. With hydroponics, you can grow vertically. You can have panels where you can move them. Outside, you have to have a row between every, uh, a walk between every row so you actually reach everything. With hydroponics, every plant is like movable. So you can pick it up and fit it into a small space and pull it out to be able to access it and harvest it and transplant and everything. Next slide. So hydroponics and aquaponics, as I mentioned, is sustainable for all these reasons. We're typically growing three to five times faster as well. The next slide, I show um, aquaponics. So aquaponics uses hydroponics, meaning fish. And so the fish excrement, which is full of the nitrogen fertilizer in the form of ammonia, gets transferred with bacteria into plant fertilizer. Um, so again, bacteria are crucial to be able to take these otherwise toxic um, but nutrient-filled compounds and turn them into a form that plants can absorb safely and that can be safe for humans um, and that can turn into food. So aquaponics is really cool. You can do this indoors. I've seen so many home systems made. And you also get fish protein as a food source out of it as well as vegetables. So next slide, you are um, encouraged once we reopen to volunteer in the greenhouse because we're year round. It's warm even in the winter in there. And we, have, we don't have aquaponics, unfortunately, but we have hydroponics and we can teach you hands on how to grow and set up and build hydroponic systems that water themselves automatically, require no weeding, can be done in your basement, um, on your kitchen counter. Um, it can really be an easy way to grow food at home. Um, next slide. Briefly, I want to talk about permaculture, um, as I mentioned before, um, is a great technique for growing food sustainably. We do have a permaculture site on campus, the Innovation Food Forest. Um, the next slide, I just have some techniques of permaculture. Um, I'm hoping to post these slides and actually post this recording later on. You can feel free to read through these last few slides on your own as well. But basically, permaculture is a word taking permanent and agriculture into one word. So instead of agriculture with annuals, like with corn and soil, you have to replant them every year, you're using perennial plants like trees and shrubs. You're able to um, grow food with much less labor. So in the next slide, here's a list of plants that are currently on campus in the Innovation Food Forest. So the goal of that site is that anybody can come through the garden and pick the food for themselves and eat it. It's free um, and it's, it's a resource on campus to learn and actually get that experience of picking and eating fresh food. The alpine strawberries are some of my favorite. They're really tiny, but they grow all season from like early spring to late fall and all summer. And they're insanely delicious. I mean, that tiny little strawberry, it tastes like a strawberry candy. It's amazing. Um, we have a ton of herbs there as well and other um, edible plants. Medicinal herbs are a great topic to get into. If you have a headache, you can just grab some leaves from the food forest and put them in your water bottle and they can help with, um, you know, stomach pains and headaches and flus and things. Um, really great um, alternative um, to traditional medicine because plants are available and they're there and um, safe. Um, next slide. Just really um, briefly, I do want to mention that there are sustainable practices even for industrial farms. Of course, stormwater management best practices are at the farmer's interest as well as the environment. There are also um, natural predators, as I mentioned, instead of using insecticides. There's also um, techniques like grazing cows under trees, growing coffee underneath trees. So even um, conventional farming can incorporate some sustainable practices. In the next slide, I do want to talk about predatory insects. I'm very passionate about sustainable pest management. Whenever you start growing food, I guarantee you will run into some kind of pest. Um, it's just, it happens. You're growing this amazing source of food. 
and bugs and things are going to come and they're going to want a bite of it too. Um, but if you know what to look for, you don't want to kill every bug. Do not kill a bug just because it looks scary and it's a bug, right? Look it up and make sure it's not a good bug because you'll see lady larva. And actually we think of ladybugs as being so cute and friendly. They're actually merciless hunters. <laughs> so the ladybug larva pictured kind of look like these weird black alligators. Um, do not kill them when you see them. They eat a ton of aphid larva. Aphid reproduce, aphids reproduce rapidly and can become a huge issue on any crop. Um, and you can just do nothing. Ladybugs will seek out your aphid infestation. They lay their eggs. The larva will eat all of your aphids. They will puke and then become adults and fly away. And you don't actually have to apply any insecticides. You can just hope and pray for natural predators, and they often will show up. There's also an image here of a lacewing larva. They actually disguise themselves as other bugs, like mealybugs, some of their favorite food sources. Um, so make sure you might think, oh, it's a mealybug, let's kill it look closer, it might be a lacewing larva just disguised as a mealybug can attack and um, eat its prey more easily. Next slide. Um, of course, we want to um, restore our forests if we can. Um, and we can also collect food from our forests. So wild foraging is a great way to um, harvest sustainable food without growing it at all. So you can go into woods, even public parks and find pawpaws which are really good native trees that go near rivers or kind of shorter trees. Um, those fruit are available in September. You can just shake the tree and the fruit go thud, 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 and you just collect them off the ground, pop them open and eat them. They're so good. I have pawpaw pulp that I harvested last year in my fridge. I just made some pawpaw pudding. It was so good and it's totally sustainable, like negative carbon footprint grown in the wild in the forest food source. Um, pictured here, I have mulberries which are really high in potassium, they're going to start ripening in June. They only are available for like one or two weeks. So be sure to look for them at the right time. They're so delicious. And you can always freeze them as well if you're able to harvest in abundance. Morel mushrooms, although tricky to identify safe mushrooms, morels are one of the um, safer varieties. Um, there are very few toxic lookalikes, although always make sure to get an expert's advice before eating any wild foraged mushrooms. Um, I also have pictured this green plant here that's planting. It is my favorite weed. It's very common. It grows in the poorest of soils in like almost every lawn, every parking lot, but it can help with bee stings and wasp stings. So you have any kind of bug bite or bee sting, you can find this plantain, not the banana you think of as plantain, but it's called plantain. And um, you can just chew the leaf and spit it out. And it's medicinally called a pul poultice. Um, and that poultice you can spit out and put and hold onto your bee sting and the pain is gone in seconds flat. I guarantee you, I've done it multiple times of a volunteer like, ah, I think I got it hurt. I'm like, here, to this leaf. And they're like, like what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they're like, oh, that worked. <laughs> You'd be surprised how well plantain works. Whenever I get a wasp or bee sting, I just search for plantain and I know I don't need to be in pain any longer. For the next slide, Really quickly, I do want to mention um, reducing beef consumption can reduce your carbon footprint immensely. Even just eating less meat, you, don't, you do not need to go full vegan, can make a huge impact. More fruits and veggies that are not packaged plastic can really um, help the environment. For the last few slides, next one, um, there's a thing called um, eating locally or being a locovore. Um, Yes, that next slide there. Yes, a local vor means you only eat local. If you've never heard of a CSA, it's when you pay a farmer ahead of time um, for the whole season. And that way it supports the farmer. They have funds for their season and you pick it up every week. You might not know what you're going to get. You might get a turnip and you don't know what to do with it, but it's fun to learn about vegetables and learn how to cook with them. Um, and also a lot of farmers cannot afford the organic certification, but they might call themselves eco-organic or pesticide free. And a lot of these farmers might actually know more about sustainable farming practices. Even that organic label, they might still be spraying organic insecticides that can harm the environment. They can still over apply fertilizer that can contribute to pollution. So organic does not necessarily mean sustainable or safer necessarily. So local farms that really know what they're doing, you can actually tour the farm and get to know your farmer is probably like the best way. You know, even I can't grow all of my own food. I still support my local farmers. It's a really great way to have your food sources more sustainable. 
On the next slide, I also highly recommend if you're willing to compost your food waste. Um, instead of going to going in the trash where it has to get transported and treated in a landfill or waste facility, if you can compost indoors using worm bins, you can actually buy specific red wiggler worms in a plastic bin and compost completely indoors. And I can teach you how to do this properly. If you balance the nitrogen and the carbon sources in your compost, it will not smell. Um, it, it, you can do certain methods to prevent flies from going in there. You can actually compost completely indoors. You do not need a yard to compost. Or um, you can also compost on campus. We have two outdoor compost community piles um, in both gardens on campus where you can actually bring your own household biodegradable waste like your eggshells and leftovers, um, cardboard, newspaper, um, veggie scraps um, and add it to the pile. Um, but you can also, if you have a yard and you're able to, some neighborhoods allow um, compost. You can get different bins or you can just make a lazy compost. Just build a pile in your yard and throw your scraps in there. Always balance your, your fresh waste with your dry um, paper, which is your carbon source, to make sure your pile doesn't get too wet or too smelly. But if you volunteer, you can really learn these methods hands-on. I can You can actually feel and see what makes compost um, break down faster and be able to smell the soil. Good compost should smell sweet, um, like nice soil and like a nice earthy smell. If your compost smells bad, you're doing something wrong and you probably need to add more carbon like paper and cardboard and stuff. Um, so next slide. Um, there are other ways to reduce food waste, of course, composting, even just homemade meals, avoiding all that styrofoam and the packaging, um, donating food so it doesn't go to waste can be helpful. Any kind of choose to reuse program can avoid packaging. I've actually been to some restaurants. I was very nervous and embarrassed to ask them. I brought my own Tupperware and I asked them, can you put my takeout food in these Tupperware containers? And they're like, oh yeah, we do it all the time, no problem. So don't be embarrassed, just give it a try. If they haven't done it, they should start to get used to it. And I think everybody could start bringing containers with them when they go out to eat to take leftovers or for takeout food, because it can really reduce the amount of um, plastic packaging that goes into our landfills. Mm -hmm. So very last slide is just a summary of how you can make a difference. Um, home gardening, community gardening, growing microgreens in your kitchen, doing a permaculture design out in your yard, even just wild foraging in the forest. You can volunteer, support local farms, eat seasonally. Above all, avoid red meat. Even just reducing your beef consumption can make a huge impact. And so um, next is just my last slide to thank you and provide um, time for questions. Thank you so much for attending my webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that it was inspiring. And um, if you need to go, that's fine. Go ahead and sign off. We will be, um, we are, we're recording this session and we're hoping to post it um, hopefully next week. We'll post the recording. I'll also post the slides for your review. Um, thank you so much for joining um, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? They can, they can type it into the chat box where you can now feel free to turn on um, your audio or video if you would like to ask questions um, vocally as well. Any questions? All right, looks like I covered a lot of material and there are no questions as always. Um, I'm available via email. You can find my email online. You can visit our website, green.gmu.edu. I have a list of plants in the food forest. I have um, resources about hydroponics. Um, there's um, so much information um, online on our websites, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have as well. And hopefully when we're back on campus, you will volunteer and learn some more of these concepts hands on. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so appreciative of all of our attendees. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your patience and I appreciate your um, presence as well. Thank you so much for listening.